All right. Um, well, pretty much all the seats are filled up, and I think we're about on time. So uh, I have an analog watch, so I could be off. Uh, all right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So um, how many of you saw the morning keynote? I was one of the speakers. OK, great. Well, I'll cruise through a lot of uh, the high-level bits, and we'll kind of spend more time on the technical details. Um, and then I have a bunch of like sort of choose your own adventure bonus stuff that we can do at the end, um, just kind of based on where your, your interest lies as a group, or probably the interests of whoever raises their hand first, um, inevitably. So uh, this is going to be talking about um, container orchestration. Um, so sort of like what we covered in the keynote was like containers are a way of packaging up applications. This is more about how to actually run those um, and sort of the properties of systems that are, are, are building these distributed systems with uh, containers. So, right, I'm the CTO and co-founder of CoreOS, systems uh, engineer for a long time. I worked at SUSE Linux, et cetera. Um, worked at Rackspace on distributed uh, systems, a combination of working on distributed cloudy stuff at Rackspace and working on low-level operating system stuff at SUSE means that I'm going to build a cloudy OS along with my co-founder, uh, Alex Colby. And so um, essentially what, what comes out of this is that um, we had the, uh, the engineering ability to build an OS and then also had learned in a bunch of paper cuts from deploying large uh, infrastructures with, uh, at the time, state-of-the-art operating systems. So where we started was building CoreOS Linux, thus the name of the company. So uh, during the demos, I'm going to be using this uh, CoreOS plus Kubernetes setup that we have. Um, the docs are up on our website, um, essentially coreos.com, and then click in the docs, and then the second section there will be Kubernetes. Um, the instructions I'll be using are on Vagrant, uh, but the instructions can be used against AWS uh, if you want to charge against your, your uh, employer's account or uh, bare metal. Um, but definitely the quickest and the easiest is local machine using Vagrant. Also, um, I'm going to be walking through some demos of stuff. The easiest way to try those out, um, I have a readme file in there along with the sample um, replication controllers and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just at the top of that uh, 2015 all things open. So uh, this is kind of covered in the keynote. Um, so what is CoreOS? Well, CoreOS is a Linux distribution. and so. What we wanted to do was create a really, really hyper-consistent Linux distribution for, <laughs> uh, for anywhere that uh, Linux could run. Wow. Ooh. <laughs> um, and so uh, unsurprisingly, CoreOS runs anywhere that Linux can run. Uh, it's primarily, if you want to um, you know, Try to think of it as through analogy. It's a it's a kernel as a service. It's a um, a container hypervisor would be another way of thinking of what CoreOS Linux is. Really minimal uh, Linux distro runs on the cloud providers, um, and then also runs uh, mysteriously on this stuff called bare bare metal. Uh, some of you may have it. Uh, most of us have gotten rid of it, and we use uh, stratoscopic uh, computers now. Not made out of hardware at all. It's kind of neat. Um, and then also we're a, a combination of a bunch of open source communities and projects, etcd, flannel, rocket. Uh, but we'll get into those details in a bit. Um, large community of, of developers uh, helping us out on this stuff. Um, and then uh, we're also uh, a company that's building enterprise software. Um, so this sort of... Um, technology is interesting to you, but you want to partner in deploying these open source technologies. Uh, CoreOS uh, Tectonic is essentially soup to nuts platform from CoreOS Linux up to the Kubernetes API with a lot of technology built in that we've built over the last few years. Um, one of those pieces of technology is Quay uh, or, or Key, uh, depending on where you're from in the world. Um, but uh, that is a hosting and build system for um, containers. Um, so it's able to say, take your Docker file, read it from your bit bucket, build a container for you, set up ACLs around it. Um, you have teams and groups and all that stuff. Uh, so that's also something that's part of you know, the overall tectonic offering. 
So with the commercial break over, um, why did we build this thing? Well, during the keynote I talked about it, but essentially this idea of a data center as a computer, I add more machines, I get more scale, machines die, I don't care, um, because my application continues running. And it's all about focusing on that application, um, the application metrics, and making sure the application continues to survive. Um, and so we talked about this during the keynote too, but it's about you as a software engineer taking your source code, packaging it into containers. Um, the container is interesting because it packages everything away from the host operating system. So you're, everything required to run that app in a process. And then we give it a name. And then hopefully, uh, if we do this right, we actually have signing so that when we deploy and provision our hardware, we say these are the people that are allowed to deploy copies and, and run processes on our host. As an operations engineer, this changes our jobs. Uh, essentially what happens is instead of thinking about um, individual hosts, we think about what our application needs and how many copies of our app we need running in order to serve traffic, um, run our map reduces, whatever. All right, so that's the overall vision. Now, how do we actually accomplish this? Um, what, what needs to change and why did we start at the operating system? Um, how, how many people like really complex API surfaces? Like who likes SOAP and XML? Right. Okay. So it's really difficult to maintain something that has a complex API surface. And I joke about SOAP. They're really great SOAP APIs. But SOAP made it so easy to just kind of export stuff from objects inside of your middleware that you end up with really complex APIs. And I think that's, people hated SOAP mostly because that's what ended up happening, not necessarily because of the technology. And so we all laugh because we hate really complex API contracts. Um, but what we've asked our Linux distros to do for the last uh, 15 years or so through package management, which package management is what caused the popularity of Linux to explode, I would argue, because at your fingertips, you're able to access you know, tens of thousands of pieces of software really easily. Um, but in the server world, it uh, complicates things. Because say I, I'm running Debian 6, um, I'm asking that, that distro to do a vast majority of my infrastructure, and I'm telling them to put a single release number on it. So I'm saying, I would like you to maintain a set of APIs for me uh, for a long period of time, I want you to abstract my hardware away with the kernel. I want you to provide me a, a basic init system. I also want you to do SSH, make sure that remains secure. You don't have my language runtime, my database. All this stuff packaged into essentially one version of, of a thing. It's a distro. And it's a really difficult API contract to maintain. I know this because I worked at SUSE. Um, I was patching kernels that were released before I had even graduated or even started college. Um, and these, maintaining these contracts over long periods of time um, and it's, it's just a difficult proposition and one that I would argue isn't really true. We promise users as distro maintainers, hey, we're not gonna break stuff, um, but I can guarantee everyone has a horror story of, oh, it's just one simple libc patch and then their entire thing goes down, right? So what we wanna do is redesign the Linux distro uh, so that it's actually providing more or fewer API contracts so what we, we essentially do with CoreOS Linux is say our API contract stops at the container runtime. At that point, you have the kernel, um, you have th what the kernel gives you, and then we're stopping. We'll make sure that kernel's up to date, we'll make sure your SSH is secure, we'll make sure that the runtime stay up to date, um, but we'll stop there. Uh, and so this kind of moves the problem around a little bit um, because now suddenly uh, we've given you a wonderful gift. Uh, we've given you the gift of maintaining your own language runtime, your own OpenSSL, et cetera. Um, and so this is good. This is good because we've now separated the concerns of application packaging from the operating system. Uh, this introduces new challenges and challenges that I think containers have yet to have a good story around. I think it will improve. Uh, companies like Google have good stories around um, actually how to maintain this complexity over time. But you end up with uh, odd and sometimes difficult to uh, resolve situations like having multiple copies of OpenSSL in production. Um, I would start to question why we have OpenSSL in most of our applications to begin with, but that's another discussion. Um, 
And so we, we've introduced this great mechanism of separation of concerns. Uh, we've introduced a few new problems, things that I think are uh, surmountable, things that we can, we can tackle. Um, but this is kind of what the opportunity was with containers, is the separation of operating system API concerns. So to just draw it really loud and clear, um, CoreOS is the little thing on the left and then containers on the right. And so this leads uh, to the concept of OS operations, this kind of new thing uh, that we can separate out from uh, DevOps or infrastructure operations, et cetera. Um, the, the focus of just being able to um, worry and concern yourself with just the operating system itself. Um, and so who, who remembers the battle days of, of Internet Explorer manual updates? Um, there's sad times. Some people are just probably in PTSD and not remembering. Um, but uh, there was a time where the, the, the front end of the internet was actually pretty terribly insecure. And every couple of weeks, we were rolling out manual updates of uh, Internet Explorer. And Firefox was a more secure browser, um, but it also had this similar like click, click, yes, next, yes, my admin password, next, yes, yes, all right, installed process that I had to do every few weeks in, in order to keep uh, my browser secure. And then Chrome came along and said, um, the API contract of a browser is fairly well understood. They're not perfect at it, but it's mostly a white box where you type Google things into. Um, and so they said, we can probably keep this application better secured uh, than the individual user can. So we'll do that automatically. Sure enough, Internet Explorer and Firefox kind of followed along. Um, and the way we do this with CoreOS is we have uh, we have an A and B partition so that we're able to do a fully atomic update. So we have two copies of CoreOS on every CoreOS machine, the active version and then the uh, passive version. While the active version is running in the background, our update service or update engine sits there, uh, updates it, um, and then notifies uh, via a few different policies, either a cluster level notification or an individual host notification. Hey, I'd like to reboot in order to apply the update. The update's already been applied, but we need to like move over to the new kernel. Um, and so at that point, we, uh, through bootloader magic in Grub that we've patched um, and is going upstream, but it's hard to work with GNU. Um, it's going upstream is, uh, will actually atomically move you over. And then if the kernel doesn't actually come up, if we don't actually reach user space, um, we do some bootloader uh, tricks on the MBR and GPT partition to track uh, whether the update was successful. And so if the machine actually wedges itself after that kernel update, you can reset it and it'll go back to the old version. Um, and hopefully we'll have a new update spun out by then. So CoreOS updates are atomic um, uh, updates with rollback, which is essentially the whole design mechanism of all this stuff is that you want to design it for atomic, meaning that we have uh, we have updates that are happening um, without interfering with each other. We do this at the OS level. You do this at the level of the application, etc. And you want to make it really easy to roll back if you make a mistake because mistakes are inevitable. Um, so the next piece of OS operations is uh, is actual machine configuration. Um, so it's not just about running processes, but figuring out how uh, to get the machine to get those processes down onto it. Um, yeah, mostly to get the machine into the cluster. Um, so uh, this font always renders poorly, but um, bear with me. The uh, basic idea is that when you boot up a CoreOS machine, you want to have um, you want to have it join some type of uh, control uh, cluster. And so um, there's a variety of different schedulers and things. People use CoreOS Linux with Mesos. They use, um, we, we wrote a scheduler called Fleet. Um, in this example, I'll be using the Kubelet. But really, they're all the same. There's a few basic pieces of information. Um, you need the IP address or DNS name of the control cluster. Um, you need some identity information. So the, in this case, the TLS certs of the control cluster and the uh, private key file of the machine so that it can identify itself and, and identify the control cluster it's connecting to. Um, and then also some miscellaneous configuration. In this case, uh, where 
the cluster's DNS uh, resolver is and where the, um, the top level domain uh, for the uh, cluster is. So at this point, what we, we've gotten up to is we've gotten up to an individual machine knows how to connect to some type of control plane uh, and we stop. So uh, we've designed the, uh, the data center equivalent of a botnet, um, which is great. Uh, it makes for nice central control of uh, these machines. The next piece is cluster operations. And this is about distributing configuration across all those worker machines that you've just configured. Um, and so one challenge with cluster operations is that we want to design for individual machine failure to be okay. And in order to do this, we need some sort of central fault tolerant configuration store. And so we built this uh, thing called etcd. Um, etcd stands for uh, slash etcd distributed. Um, we have this strategy where we try to name things incomprehensible names. So etcd, quay, um, it's just part of our branding. Make sure that nobody can find anything. Um, and so slash etsy distributed, so it acts essentially as a cluster level slash etsy, so where we, where we store configuration data. Um, only it's designed quite a bit differently. It's not a POSIX file system, although people have written a Fuse file system where you can mount etcd uh, locally, which is super adorable. I wouldn't recommend it for any use case, um, but it, it is kind of fun to debug and play around with. Um, so etcd is designed uh, as a key value store, so you're able to set and put keys, um, but it has this special property that um, it's able to do leader elections on its own. So a regular etcd cluster looks like this. You have five members. Uh, generally, we say five members because you want to be able to have one unexpected outage, so Jimmy the intern trips over the cable, and then one planned outage, which is like, I need to upgrade this host or pull a disk or whatever. Um, so this, this gives you some tolerance. And so uh, Jimmy, Jimmy tripped, and then I took the machine out of rotation. Um, but etcd remains available, uh, and you can continue to write into etcd. Um, now, uh, etcd becomes unavailable after a third machine in this five ma machine cluster goes down. And this is because uh, etcd is able to do auto leader election. The only way to make this safe without uh, split brain conditions is for 50 50% plus one of the cluster to be available. Um, so you always have a majority uh, and you never split brain. Now that's, that's not super interesting um, because most databases have a strong leader like Postgres and the idea of having a, a weak read-only follower. And so uh, that wouldn't be super useful at all, um, except for etcd actually designs for um, handling leader failures. So if the self-elected leader of the cluster fails for whatever reason, um, etcd within uh, five to 10 times RTT, RTT is generally uh, around your network latency. Um, generally, this is gonna be around a second or two seconds. Uh, etcd will figure out that the leader has been lost, um, talk amongst themselves and elect a new leader. Meanwhile, any writes that you've uh, put in to etcd will essentially pause until the leader election happens and then those writes will go through. So the whole system is designed essentially to be a database for central configuration that's tolerant to machine failure. Um, and this is why a lot of systems that are you know, focused on this Google-like infrastructure are starting to build on top of things like etcd. Um, oh, right. And then, of course, if you lose a third machine still after a leader election, etcd is unavailable. So cluster operations. Uh, you know, they need this configuration store, but really what it's about is what should be running in your cluster. So there's a lot of different schedulers out there. Um, Kubernetes has a scheduler, Mesos has a scheduler. We wrote a scheduler called Fleet. Um, HashiCorp came out with one called Nomad, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Schedulers are like a fun thing to write. They're awesome. We wrote one, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and they, they do get to the point where they provide a minimum amount of usefulness, great. Um, but uh, you know, schedulers are just about getting the work to the, to the individual uh, machines in the cluster. Um, and that's, that's a pretty easy job, actually. Um, we've, we've all done this ourselves, right? Like, we've all been schedulers. 
Um, who's used an actual schedule-based system like Borg or Mesos or something like that at work? Okay, very few people. So we've all, we've all written schedulers, right? Like this is the scheduler that most of us use when we start our careers. The uh, write some code, S copy it to the server, and then launch it, okay? Um, who's used systemd run? Who's used screen in production? Okay, so systemd run is like screen done correctly. Um, what it does is it creates a service um, on the command line. So you do systemd run and then whatever command you want, and it returns you a proper systemd service file. Um, and then you can like check back in on that service file. Uh, you get C groups information, you get log information, you can actually tail the logs of it. Um, it's not running as your user, it doesn't have access to your environment variables or your SSH agent, all things that you know the thing you ran in screen has access to. Um, please stop running things in screen. Um, but this is the scheduler that a lot of us start with, is the S copy it to a host and run it thing. Um, woo, we schedule it to the box. Um, and then maybe we'll get really fancy, we'll use like Fabric or Capistrano, um, and we'll have a set of hosts, uh, maybe like eight hosts on AWS, and then we'll deploy the app, so we'll run this Fabric file and it'll just go through one by one um, to each of the hosts and deploy the app. So that, that's, that's uh, something that a lot of us do as the next step, is oh, I've got to automate my deploys, S is no longer handling it. Or maybe we'll get more sophisticated and we'll go to Dell and be like, I need some beefy boxes, you know? There's a couple of beefy boxes in the rack because I'm gonna be doing some log aggregation on these boxes or I'm gonna be doing a heavy database workload. So we choose a couple of beefy boxes, these yellow boxes that are the special boxes um, and we kind of partition our cluster into a couple of different things. So we deploy that app onto those. Um, or, uh, <clears throat> or maybe we'll get really sophisticated and we'll say, you know, I'm gonna have a resource aware scheduler so I can kind of pick a box in my cluster that doesn't have a lot of work happening. So maybe we'll choose, we'll write like a fabric script that finds the host with the lowest low average, so SSH into them and run load average. And it'll say, all right, host one has the lowest load average, and so you'll deploy uh, your job to that, to that host. So this is kind of giving us a sense of what schedulers actually do, which is um, they do things like look for hosts inside that we have that, um, that have low resource utilization, um, and they free us up from this kind of mental thinking of, well, I need some special hosts that handle this workload and I need to think about which ones are not doing a lot of work today so that I can put my jobs over there. It kind of frees us up from thinking about these problems. And so the, the basic workflow of a scheduler-based system like Kubernetes um, is that you uh, write down on, on some APIs or in some JSON or YAML files uh, that you want some X number of copies of your app running. You talk to the scheduler API. The scheduler is this little active piece of software um, that, whose only job is to look at what the human has asked for, look at the machines and what they're currently doing, and then schedule that work to individual machines. And so the reason I say schedulers are fun to write is because the algorithm's really, really simple, but it looks really powerful when you do it. Um, so it's really just a couple of data structures. You have the desired state, which is what the human beings have put into the system as what they want the computers to be doing. Um, and then you have the current state, which is generally, uh, it's, it's just the up-to-date version of what the computers think they're doing currently. Um, so, you know, what's running on what hosts. Uh, you do a diff of these things, and then all the magic, all the white papers, et cetera, are written in this other function called schedule, which is, uh, well, how do, how do we take our current state and desired state and then figure out an efficient packing um, that will end up being the best fit um, for the work that needs to be done. And so that schedule routine takes these two things and then maps it down onto a host. And so how this works in practice is that um, we say something like uh, kubectl run, uh, we give the, the intention, this idea of a replication controller, um, a name, so host info. We say the image it wants to run from and how many we need. A few seconds later, the system figures it out and actually launches a copy of the application. And then similarly later we can say, all right, cool, the application is running, but now I need two copies of it. Scale it up for me. 
And this is, uh, we'll go into details of how this works, but this is why it's important to kind of give our thing a name, like host info, um, this idea of a replication control and a name so that we can update it later and say, you know that thing I told you to do where I want you to run one of these things? Well, now I need you to run two of these things. You need something that's tracking state of what your intent was over time. And so we can think about why this is important right now with this example. So I have this replication controller. We can think of the replication controller as your intent, similar to a thermostat. So when we walk into a room, we turn the thermostat. Our intent is for the thermostat to talk to the heater to make whatever is currently the ambient temperature the new temperature by turning the heater on and off. Similarly, we describe our work through these, this concept of a replication controller. This replication controller, um, we'll say, is web prod. Um, it's a, in control of applications that match environment equals prod and app equals web. And we've told our replication controller, that's weird, we told our replication controller that we want one of these applications running. Now, the, the current state on the other side shows that there's three versions of the application running, three copies. Can anyone imagine what's going to happen next? All right. After lunch crowd. Got it. Got it. Uh, what's going to happen is that the computers are going to change the state of the world from three copies of the application running to one copy. Because the human told the system, look, everything labeled environment equals prod and app equals web. I need you, computer, to go talk to all the machines and make sure that only one of those is running. So over time, sitting there, the thermostat's working, 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 and we get to our desired state. All right, we're going to try a second time. Uh, let's say that I tell the system that I want count equals five. You want to imagine how many copies are going to come out of this. Um, so the, the host is, the, the scheduler system is actually going to move, uh, talk to the machines, talk to the scheduler, and, and move up to five copies of the app. Pretty straightforward. Um, so this is the idea of a replication controller. It sounds complicated. Um, it's a lot. It's a mouthful. Um, I really hate the name, but that's the object that they've decided to call it: replication controller. Um, and that's what it does. It's a thermostat for our deployments. Now, uh, I say schedulers are fun to write because getting work onto the servers is really easy, right? Anyone can do that. You can write four i in sequence one ten ssh, like scheduler system. The hard part is the service discovery. So if I, if I told you, like, you know, I, I just wrote this great scheduler system. It put all the work on the machines. I'm heading home. You'd be pretty upset at me. Because now you have all this work happening on your host. You have no idea how to load balance it. You have no idea what version is running where. And so um, the second side of this is you actually need APIs and, and ways of figuring out where is the work that was just scheduled running. Um, and then you want to expose it in, in useful and interesting ways. Um, DNS is, uh, is not the best thing that's ever been invented. Um, but it is, uh, is ubiquitous. And so um, Kubernetes exposes services as DNS entries. Um, it also will generate load balancers for you, so L3 load balancers. Um, in the next version, it will generate L7 load balancers. Um, and then also you can talk to the API directly and start to query the API and figure out um, where services have landed that have been scheduled. And Kubernetes has this very interesting and powerful concept called labels. Um, and, and the labels allow you to essentially have queries uh, that, that find objects inside of the system. Very, very much similar to how we have SQL queries uh, to find things inside of our structured data. Labels allow us to find um, things, objects, running services, and, and applications inside of our cluster. So there's a few patterns of how you can use uh, labels. This, uh, a pod essentially is a running application, a running container image. Um, it's called a pod because you can have multiple things inside of the running application. So uh, imagine that you have Nginx. Nginx is serving up your static assets for your website. Um, and you don't want to kill this, this Nginx instance every time you have to update one of the images in your static website, right? So a pod that for your static website could be Nginx, and then it could be this uh, little daemon that sits in a while loop pulling from a Git repository or rsyncing from a repository. And so these two things are like logically coupled, 
Um, and they're like a single application, but there's two pieces of code that are operating together. There's the Nginx thing, serving up HTTP traffic, and the syncer thing. And so this is the concept of a pod. And the pod is the ubiquitous, like addressable, running application inside of Kubernetes. Now, pods you can label. So when I say I want to run an application, I can label it, say, environment equals dev, app equals web, uh, environment equals test, app equals web, environment equals prod, app equals web. And this is a very common pattern that a lot of us use, is having these, these different deployments of our application up and running at a time. Now, this actually starts to get fun when we uh, think about adding load balancers to the situation. So we can have uh, a service that selects for environment equals dev and puts it behind test.example.com for our application. Um, or we can have beta.example.com that selects for env equals test and env equals prod. And so you can start to test, well, how's this rolling update going to look um, when I have to have you know, our testing version and our prod version behind the same load balancer, which is inevitable. Um, how is that going to look for users? Are we going to have quirky UX behavior, et cetera? And then, of course, you can have your production load balancer that has it selects only for environment equals prod. And so by using these label queries, we actually start to uh, be able to design for it and map the way our cluster operates to the way that we think about things and the way we organize systems uh, for humans to consume. And naturally, of course, these, uh, these selections, these label selections, work across all instances that are labeled this way. Um, so whether that's one or five or a thousand copies. <clears throat> you can also start to do interesting things with uh, versioning. So I can say, you know, app equals foo. So I have a service um, that finds all versions of foo, no matter if it's version one or two or three. Um, and so you can imagine like moving a load balancer, doing blue green deploys, that sort of thing. And the way this is done from the command line um, and through the API of Kubernetes is you, you have your replication controller, which maps to a number of pods that have been launched. Those pods have labels of some sort that you've set up. And you can say, given the replication controller and its labels, I want you to expose a port for me um, that will be accessible to the cluster. And, and what this actually does is it generates a random port number and maps it to an external IP address on your worker machines. We'll get into why this is necessary, but the, the basic idea is that because most of our hosts today only have a single IP, so uh, when we think about hosts, we don't think about hosts running lots and lots of applications. We think about a single host, and that host has a number of ports, and those applications are through those ports. Um, Inside of Kubernetes, every single pod gets its own IP address. And that IP address needs to be routable between pods, between hosts. So it starts to look a lot more like a network that we would use inside of a infrastructure as a service, where you have you know, n number of virtual machines, and those virtual machines need to be able to address other virtual machines on other hosts. Uh, and in a similar way, Kubernetes has every pod as its own IP address. Um, this doesn't map very well to a lot of network fabrics. Um, that we have inside of our data centers, inside of our clouds, et cetera. So this node port allows us to expose on worker machines this consistent IP address that kind of maps very logically to the world that we have today, where a lot of us have this text file internally that's version controlled and everyone hates, where it's like, you know, port 32,158 is application foo, and port 32,159 is application bar. Um, and this is kind of how we do load balancing, et cetera, in our data centers. So uh, how does this look in practice? Um, these are a lot of moving pieces. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to understand and digest here, but how does this look in practice? Um, we have a single scheduler API. Um, we have an etcd, which is acting as a database. And then we have a lot of machines. Um, so one thing that people get super afraid of is they're like, whoa, I have nothing like Google like needs. I, I need like five machines to run my application. Well, that's fine. This architecture scales down just fine. Um, so right now on my host, I have four machines. I have an etcd machine, a schedule API, and a worker machine. Um, and then if you're getting uh, really resource constrained, it actually scales down just fine to one node where you have the worker machine and the scheduler and everything on one host. Um, and that's, that's an option that you have, too, if you want to run it on Vagrant, run it on a single AWS host or something like that. Um, that's what I use for my IRC bouncer. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so it, it kind of just scales down to, it's just about having an API and then having that API launch processes on your host. All right, so uh, I'm gonna dive into a few minutes of demos here. Um, again, if you wanna try this out at home, uh, chorus.com, docs, Kubernetes, you can find this all there. So, um, so I have a couple of things. Um, one is that I have a cluster that's running Rocket. Um, so it's Kubernetes plus the Rocket runtime. Um, we built Rocket uh, as a alternative to Docker because we had a number of things that we wanted to see Docker doing differently. Uh, we can get into those details. We also have a document that explains in detail, but it's mostly about process model. Um, Rocket follows a very traditional Unix process model where when I say Rocket run, it actually runs as a child or as the process that executed Rocket run. Um, Docker has this whole RPC mechanism where you type Docker run and you get logs out to your standard out, but it's actually talking to a daemon and that daemon forks the exact things. Um, it causes problems overall with the architecture. So we built Rocket to fix that and a bunch of other things that um, we just like, didn't like architecturally about the, rock, da the Docker daemon. Um, so I have, uh, I have this um, example cluster here. Um, use context, oh, kubectl, goodness, kubectl config. So one, one nice thing about uh, Kubernetes is it has this really nice uh, command line tool called kubectl. Can everyone see the text? Okay. Uh, command line tool called kubectl. Um, and kubectl allows you to address lots of different clusters, um, similar to the AWS command line tools. So I'm saying that I want to use my vagrant single member cluster here. Um, and so we're able to check that the API endpoint works correctly by you know, saying git pods or git nodes. Nodes are the actual worker machines in the cluster. Um, so that, that all works great. So what I'm gonna be doing here is uh, I've selected the right cluster, so what I'm gonna do is, is launch a service. So I have this really simple service that I wrote called host info, just dump some IP address and, uh, and other metadata about the inside of the container. So we'll run kubectl run this. And so what will happen is that this will create a replication controller that uses that name and just launch one copy of it. So uh, Kubernetes has this really nice uh, events in interface, so I'm able to um, kind of get a tail of the log of what's happening. Uh, and so what we'll see here is that it's really gross and ugly, sorry, um, big fonts. But it says at the very bottom that the container has been started. So now I should be able to do uh, git pods and see that there's one, one copy of host info running. Now the next thing is, like that's sort of interesting, but now I just know that there's a process running. I actually need to be able to hit it behind a load balancer. So this next step is to say, I want to expose uh, through a, a node port um, 5483, which is the port that this application listens on, um, expose this as a service. So now we should be able to do kubectl get service host info. And we'll see that there's a load balancer running um, called host info. And we, if we describe it, we should see that it assigned it a high port number for us to hit. So the next thing to do here is that um, we'll go ahead and hit it on our web browser. Um, so the IP address of the virtual machine that this is running on is 172.17.499. So then we plug in the port and then, woohoo, it worked, live demos. Um, and so uh, we, we essentially set up a load balancer, set up a basic stateless web application, and that stateless web application dumps out some metadata about the host it's running on. Um, so that, that's great. Uh, and then what's neat here is that we can start to really trivially um, scale it up. So we can say, all right, I have one copy, but I, I want multiple copies. So if we go through here and get pods again, we should see that there's one copy running and one copy pending, okay? That'll get added to the load balancer and it'll actually eventually get running. Um, general error, perfect, live demos. Okay, so um, it's probably pulling it. Oh, there we go. Um, so at this point, we should be able to do things like watch, oops, um, watch uh, and fetch the actual uh, application um, and be hitting it 
behind the load balancer, and you'll see it's flopping between number of visitors of five and 47 because I'm hitting two things behind the load balancer. Okay, <clears throat> um, so cool. Now, I have a little bit of time for more demo, but are these, these are 40 minute sessions, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. So what I'm gonna do here is pause the demo. Um, I'd love to go further into this stuff. Uh, if you wanna grab me in the hallway, I'd love to go through more of it. I'll leave a little bit of time for questions and uh, call it that. So thank you. Hey, yes. Yep. Right, so CoreOS, uh, we use upstream kernel.org kernels. Um, these live patching things, there's a lot of these live patching things. Oracle has one, SUSE has one, I think Red Hat has one now. Um, these are great for, I'm running like air traffic control and we found that like there's an MM leak and I really can't reboot this air traffic control right now. But it's not gonna be like the, we introduced a new PHY in our network controller or like any of these more complex patches. And so uh, all of those live patches require human invention and suddenly your kernel is completely inconsistent because the on disk state of your kernel and the live state of your kernel are divergent. Um, and so what we're driving for is fault tolerance of individual hosts and extreme consistency and live patching is just not something that we're interested in doing. There are some interesting things you can do with checkpoint restore and stuff. That's more researchy, like a few years from now, live updating of the kernel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so th that was the next part of the demo. There's, um, so the neat thing about putting, uh, oh, sorry. So the question was, uh, with microservices, is there any view where you can see, like, this app talks to that app and et cetera, et cetera, kind of decom decomposition of the application. And so um, the nice thing about this idea of services and labels and replication controllers is that you can really trivially um, start to build those architecture diagrams because you can say um, this service depends on this other service and then you can get a view of, well, that other service has 18 copies running on these hosts and then you can actually like drill down from uh, logical service, the dependent services, the individual hosts. Um, and all the metadata is there. Uh, there hasn't been a great visualization of it yet. Um, the tectonic dashboard that we have allows you to drill down for individual like services to pods to hosts. Um, but I think over time you'll see more of those sorts of things. Um, I think it gets more interesting once you think about like network flow analysis and that sort of thing, or even adding in RPC awareness. So you can say this customer request was tagged with foobar XYZ request and you actually track it through the system um, between hosts. So that's all future work and we have to like lay the foundation and we're laying foundation right now. All right, I'm out of time. Uh, if you want some more stickers, feel free and otherwise, thank you.